are not uh, familiar with Assyriology uh, or Asian Near Eastern Studies, a short introduction on what we are and what we do. As Assyriologists, we study the history, languages and archaeology of Mesopotamia, which is nowadays Iraq, northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey and western Iran. We do so uh, mainly by studying the textual sources of that period, namely the cuneiform tablets. As you can see from this example, these are pillow-shaped clay tablets on which cuneiform writing is impressed using a stylus with a cuneiform top. The Sumerians, based in the south of Mesopotamia, near the Persian Gulf, developed this writing system at the end of the fourth millennium BCE. It was in use for more than 3,000 years by various peoples who used it to write various languages, such as Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Hittites, Elamites, and so on and so on. There are, there are an estimated one million of cuneiform tablets kept in various museums and collections all over the world, only a small part of which, about 15%, has been deciphered, transliterated, translated, and studied. Uh, my particular interest uh, lies in the socio-economic history of Babylonia, the southern part of Mesopotamia, during what we call the Old Babylonian period, roughly the first half of the second millennium BCE. This is the period of the famous king Hammurabi, of whom you might have heard, or maybe of his famous law code currently in the Louvre. More particularly, my research is focused on the old Babylonian city of Sippar, situated in northern Babylonia, on the ancient course of the Euphrates River, uh, about 30 kilometers upstream from the capital Babylon. Sippar consists of two urban centers, located each on a bank of the river, about five kilometers apart. In the south, on the right bank of the main branch of the ancient course of the Euphrates, the larger one, called in antiquity Sippar Yahrurum, nowadays the archaeological site of Abu Habba, and in the north, on the left bank, the smaller one, called in antiquity Sippar Amnanum, nowadays Tel Eder. On this Google Earth view, you can see both archaeological sites in their current state, Abu Habba in the south and Tel Eder in the north. At the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, many cuneiform tablets from private archives were found in both sites during early and or illicit excavations, the majority of which found their way often through the antique markets to large European and North American museums and collections. An estimated 10,000 tablets from Sippar, the majority from Abu Habba, are kept nowadays in museums such as the British Museum, the Louvre, uh, Pennsylvania University Museum, Yale Collection, Berlin, and so on and so on. In the second half of the 20th century, small-scale excavations were organized by Iraqi archaeologists at Abu Habba, and these tablets are currently in the Iraqi Museum in Baghdad. In the 1970s and 80s, a Ghent University team headed by Léon de Meyer and Hermann Gash organized excavations in the smaller northern site, Tel Eder, where they excavated a house in which a private archive of about 2,500 tablets was found. Study of the archive showed that the house belonged to a man called Urutu, who lived in the 17th century BCE, and he was a chief church singer of the Temple of Anunitum. Only a small part of his archive has been published yet. The tablets are now in the Iraqi Museum, but have been filmed by Michel Torre so that they are available for study. So in all, we have about 12,000 tablets from Old Babylonian Sippar. These are mostly what we call documentary texts, day-to-day -day economic, legal, and administrative texts, such as lease, sales, and loan contracts, divisions, donations, litigations, but also receipts, expenditures, documents on taxations, land registers, bookkeeping documents, bookkeeping lists, and letters, both official letters, such as from the king in Babylon to the local authorities in Sippar, and private letters. It goes without saying that this abundance of day-to-day -day sources is a mine of information, not only on the socio-economic history of Sippar and its inhabitants in general, but on the ups and downs of various families and the lives and careers of individuals in particular. However, some elements make this somewhat difficult. First, 
These tablets are scattered across museums and collections all over the world. As a result, these are sometimes difficult to access for study. Much worse is the fact that the vast majority of the tablets have not been scientifically excavated. This means we have no archaeological or archival information of these tablets. We don't know where, in which house, in which room, in which archaeological layer, together with which other tablets they were found. As such, parts of ancient archives have become scattered across the various museum collections and sometimes even fragments of the same tablet ended up in different museums. The archive found in Urutu's house by the Ghent University team is up to now the only large scientifically excavated old Babylonian private archive. The study of this archive has so far taught us much about the composition and structure of old Babylonian private archives. But for the majority of the SIPAR material, however, we must try to reconstitute ancient archives or assemble otherwise related groups of tablets or dossiers through study. The preferred way to do this is through prosopography, which gave rise to the idea of developing the database, which I will dwell upon in a minute in the first place. Another difficulty to overcome is the way in which the tablets are published, how they have been made accessible for further study and analysis. A great part of the tablets is only published in hand copy or line drawing of the cuneiform signs on the tablet. A hand copy is always an interpretation anyway, but certainly in the case of the older publications, the tablets have not been copied in a paleographic manner and are therefore not always very reliable. Moreover, these hand copies often do not include seal impressions on the tablets and are therefore incomplete. This is an example of a hand copy by Pinches from 1898 and a photo from the actual tablet I took in the British Museum. As you can see, the drawing is not at all truthful as far as the cuneiform signs are concerned, but also the shape and contours of the tablet are not indicated. But most importantly, the seals impressed on the upper left and lower edges and reverse are not included. These, however, may contain valuable information, such as patronymic and title of the persons who sealed the tablet. Another part of the tablets is only published in transliterations, which again are interpretations and can therefore contain errors, especially as our knowledge on the reading of a cuneiform script has evolved over time and still is. It is, in other words, crucial to go back to the primary sources, the tablets themselves, in order to collate the text and correct and complete if necessary. But let us now go to the subject of the talk, the relational database developed at the research unit of Assyriology at Ghent University. First, I will give a rough sketch of the origin, development and functioning of the database. Then I will go into the matter of prosopography and more particularly its application in and value for old Babylonian socioeconomic history. And I will end up with uh, possible new lines of research. The original aim back in the 1990s of its initiator, Michel Tanré, was to develop a prosopographical database in order to facilitate the handling of tens of thousands of personal names that were mentioned in the day-to-day -day administrative, legal and economic tablets and letters from old Babylonian SIPA. In order to do this, 4D, or four dimension, a relational database management system developed by Ribardière in the 1980s was chosen. Since then, the database has been expanded, not only in terms of data, especially as more and more old Babylonian Sipar tablets, since long kept in various museums, were being and still are being published, but also in terms of structure and has been given the name Siprosop, standing for prosopography of old Babylonian Sipar. Originally, uh, two main tables were linked to each other, a name table including all information on the attested personal names and their owners, such as spelling, title, gender, family relation, family name, role, and a tablet table, including all information on the texts, such as tablets and or case, publication, museum and or collection number, dossier or archive, genre, date, and seals. As such, it became possible to single out all persons mentioned in one text or a selection of texts based on genre, date, or dossier. To find all persons bearing the same title, playing the same role, etc., etc. Most imp importantly, though, 
it became possible to identify various persons mentioned in various texts as one and the same actual historical person to reconstruct their genealogy and to define their roles within society. Here you see a screenshot of all persons attested in the sale of a field from the 21st year of reign of Hammurabi. Their names, titles, professions, the role they play in the text, family relation, etc. The next slide shows a screenshot of a part of all persons bearing the same name. In this case, Belesunu, the text in which she is attested, the genre and date of these texts, the role she plays in the texts, her title, her profession and patronymic. And based on patronymic, title and profession, period of attestation and to a lesser degree the role played in the text, it is possible to identify various Belesunus attested in various texts as one and the same historical person being Belesunu, the daughter of Ikun Pisin, Naditum priestess of the sun god Shamash, an active businesswoman during the reigns of Hammurabi and Samsui Luna. Over the years, the structure of the database was expanded with a third table, a seal table, including all information on the seals, such as publication, iconography, legend, kiship or biscript, owner, user, drawings, photos, etc. This table is linked to the tablet table through the seal tablet lock table, which contains information on where exactly on the case or tablet the seal has been impressed. In order to facilitate the iconographical study of the seals, the seal table was linked to a seal scenes table and seal motives table, including all information on the seal scenes, such as presentation, contest or other scenes, and all information on the main figures and film motifs. As such, it became possible to single out all seals containing a seated king, a llama or a forelocked hero as main figure, a vase, a trident, griffin or crescent as film motif, and link these to their owners and users, the period during which they were used and the tablets on which they were impressed. It also became possible to single out all the seals one person or more persons belonging to a family or a professional group owned and or used during their careers, the period of their usage and to study their iconography. This slide shows a screenshot of seal number 24, the seal of Ilum Mushalim, the gatekeeper of the Gagum, including a list with the various tablets on which this seal has been impressed, who used it, the genre and date of the text, the role of the user of the seal in the text, photos of partly impressions of the seal on these tablets and a compilation drawing of the seal made on the basis of these partly impressions. It also includes a description of the iconography of the seal, which leads us to the following slide with detailed information on scenes and main figures. Most recently, a genealogy table was introduced, linked to the name table to give an instant glimpse of a person's family tree if known. For some of the important families of Sipar, it is possible to reconstruct an extensive family tree, such as for the family of Ikun Pisi, the father of the aforementioned businesswoman Belesunu, whose family could be reconstructed for six generations. Moreover, the tablet table was expanded by including a full transliteration of the texts, as well as keywords, making it possible to search all text for geographical names, specific words and phrases and so on. As such, it became, for example, possible to single out all texts mentioning a particular irrigation district in order to find out during which period it was attested, which persons owned land there and in the vicinity of which other geographical features it was located. Until now, the database contains information on 67,663 attestation of personal names, including the spelling of the name, the title, profession, gender, role in the text, family relation, family name, etc. And where possible, an identification code, identifying them as an actual historical person and a ge genealogy. And these artist, uh, attestations are extracted from 9,186 texts, including all published administrative, legal and economic texts and letters from Old Babylonian Sipar. And then I mean both sides, uh, the north and the south side. Sipar Yachrurum and Sipar Ananum, all texts belonging to the Urutu archive excavated in Sipar Ananum, and a selection of unpublished administrative, legal, and economic texts from Sipar kept mainly in the British Museum. 
Full transliterations of the majority of them are already included. However, whereas a part of these texts has already been collated and photographed in the various museums, this process is still ongoing. This is necessary as hand copies are not always reliable and some texts are published only in transliteration, as I mentioned earlier. But it is of utmost importance with regard to the seal impressions, which were not always included in the text publications, especially in the older ones, or were often treated in a stepmotherly way, which brings me to the next point. The database also contains information uh, on um, 7,458 um, uh, uh, seal impressions, including all published seal impressions on uh, old Babylonian Sipar tablets, most seal impressions from the tablets from the Urutu archive, and a selection of seal impressions uh, from published and unpublished texts, in this case also mainly from the British Museum. A full iconographical description and analysis, photographs of the impressions, often on various tablets, a composite drawing if possible, the location of the impression on the case or tablet, the legend and or by script, identifying the owner and or user, if possible, of nearly half of them are already included in the database. It goes without saying that this is a work in progress. There are still a lot of unpublished tablets from SIPAR in various museum collections. But for the moment, our first and foremost aim is to collate and photograph the rest of the texts, in particular those on which seals were impressed. This, however, takes a lot of time and effort, especially as it is only useful to collate texts after having studied them in their context. Which brings me to the next point, the possibilities and limitations of the prosopographical approach to old Babylonian socioeconomic history. Being incredibly abundant with day-to-day -day administrative, legal and economic texts and letters from private archives, mentioning all sorts of agents, the prosopographical approach is preeminently suitable to study the population of old Babylonian Sippar, its social structures and processes, and the evolution they underwent throughout this 400-year period. Prosopography is certainly no new methodology. It has proven its worth, and although mainly known of and developed within classical and medieval studies, it has been and still is regularly used in ancient Near Eastern studies and Assyriology, for example, the prosopography of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. However, prosopographic, uh, prosopographic approaches may vary depending on the period studied and the nature of the sources, going from small-scale studies on selected groups of social elites, often also called comparative biographies, to forms of quantitative prosopography, which are concerned with much wider populations, including particularly ordinary people. In their short manual to the art of prosopography, Verboven, and Carlier and Dumoulin stress the fact that Prosopography, by definition, requires interdisciplinarity. A prosopographical database itself is not the final stage of an historical investigation. Results of the processed data from a prosopographical database are not in themselves explanations, but they provide arguments to explain historical phenomena. Therefore, other disciplines such as onomastics, genealogy, sociography and microhistory are essential in conducting a prosopographical study. As stated by the same authors, the prosopographical approach is by definition an inductive method. It starts from concrete data extracted from primary sources concerning individuals and individual behavior and aims at understanding general phenomena. By collecting all relevant data of groups of individuals in a systematic way, prosopography aims at drawing a picture of the collective. As for the old Babylonian period, Prosopography has been primarily used in studies on individuals, families or households or selected groups of people. Complementary to these studies, which are without any doubt of great value for our understanding of old Babylonian society, it is crucial to go one step further and examine a wider population. In the case of CPOSOP, the analysis of the sum of data about all individual, individuals mentioned in the day-to-day -day administrative, legal and economic texts and letters from old Babylonian CIPAR can inform us about the different types of connection between them and help us to understand how they operated within the social, economic, legal and religious institutions of their time. Of particular interest here is the connection between prosopography and microhistory. The microscopic analysis of apparently insignificant events, objects and or persons. For example, individuals mentioned in ration and other administrative lists or witnesses mentioned at the end of the legal and economic documents, 
will shed light on the complex relations tying individuals into the fabric of a society. The description and analysis of the various social groups through sociography will offer an insight into the social dynamics. In this context, social network analysis as a way to visualize social relations can yield interesting results, but only when a large and reliable database has been built. As an example of how the collection of data on phenomena that transcend individual lives generates interesting social insights, I give here the meta-analysis of economic transactors in the old Babylonian economic, economic and legal text from SIPAR I have been and still am working on, and which revealed, among other things, a significant female economic activity during the reigns of Simu Balit, Hammurabi and Samsui Luna. During this 100-year period, the active participation of women in sale and lease transactions nearly equals that of men, as is shown in these graphs. Notwithstanding the many um, advantages and possibilities offered by the prosopographical approach, there are a number of problems and limitations we have to take into consideration when applying prosopography in the socioeconomic history of the old Babylonian period. For we have to deal with the qualitative limitations related to our sources. Our text primarily involves the urban elites and marginal groups are hardly ever documented. Whereas prosopography certainly helps to overcome the problem of the representativeness of our source material by including all available data, data that otherwise would have been disregarded, such as often poorly understood administrative lists mentioning personal names, witness lists at the end of legal and economic documents, or seal impressions without legend or by script mentioning a name, which are at first sight difficult to link to an owner or user. We must, however, always bear in mind that our sources primarily involve the urban elites and that only very sporadically other parts of the population are mentioned. Catherine, it seems like it seems like your uh, microphone go go went into mute for some reason. We can't hear you yet. Maybe go out and come in again? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not no, quite sure what either. happened. No. It that that's similar to what happened with mine. Maybe it's uh, Yeah. It loses the connection with the hardware microphone. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Ray for technology. Yes. Yes, um, yes Catherine. To... Yeah. Just try to come back. That worked with you, Sally, right? Yes. Let's see if that works. The beauties of the same problem. One one solution could it be uh, for her to use the the phone, the microphone, uh, on the phone? Ah, yeah, sure. Let's see. Let's fingers crossed that when she comes back, uh, she can speak again. That's weird when it happens halfway through. Yeah, it has never happened to me before. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's the first time that I see it. Hello. Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, sorry. My cat. <laughs> you might have to share your um, screen again, Katrin, uh, or not, or is it there? Sorry, maybe not. Oh, no, sorry, it's still there, so that's okay. It's still there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. So I continue? Perfect, yes, please. All right. Um, where were we? Um, social bias. Okay, we must be fully aware of this social bias. Um, wait a minute. 
now I lost my screen. <laughs> okay. Can I go? No, I didn't can't. I'm sorry. Yes, now I can. Okay, fine. Um, another problem to be considered is that of the archaeological and archival context. Unfortunately, the majority of our sources originate from the antiques markets and illicit diggings and therefore lack archaeological and archival context. Prosopography can help us to compose dossiers containing texts mentioning persons that are related by family, tribally, socially or professionally, and even to try to reconstruct parts of archives. However, we have to be very cautious in this matter and always be fully aware that they are but reconstructions. The composition and structure of private archives is far more complex and hard to comprehend as is shown by the Urutu archive and as will be shown uh, in the near future when archaeologists uh, dig up my office. Um, the identification of persons on the basis of names, patronymics, uh, functions and titles is often problematic. Um, especially as patronymics and or titles and functions are not always systematically mentioned in our sources and different individuals may have the same name. Changing names after ordination, various spellings of names, the usage of nicknames or diminutives and changing patronymics after adoption makes it even more difficult. On the other hand, onomastics can offer important additional information for prosopographical research, especially when particular names are typical of members of a, spe a specific social class, such as, for example, the Naditum Priestess names. And finally, we should mention uh, the problem of the reliability of some text publications, as I uh, mentioned earlier. So in conclusion, we can state that the prosopographical uh, collection of data digitized in a database is a necessary first step in the study of old Babylonian society. And as mentioned above, this is not a straightforward collection of data, but has to be achieved through a meticulous process of collation, correction and contextualization in order to establish a firm basis. This certainly also goes for data from other old Babylonian cities. And in this context, I would like to say a few words on a new project proposal Sally and I have been working on in collaboration with uh, colleagues um, from uh, the Ghent Center for Digital Humanities, the Language and Translation uh, Technique team, the Faculty Library ID Lab, as well as colleagues from Imaging Lab Cailleuve and the Royal Museums of Art and History in Brussels, where a small collection of cuneiform tablets is kept, among which about 50 tablets from the old Babylonian period from various cities, Sipar, Larsa, Nippur, Marat, and so on, which have been digitized using 2D plus um, uh, document imaging techniques by Imaging Lab Cailleuve. Our aim is to enrich and contextualize this group of tablets with tablets from other museum collections worldwide uh, on the basis of prosopography in order to build meaningful dossiers and reconstructed archives. This complete corpus will then be prepared and published using IIIF and annotated, including not only transliterations and translations, but also entities such as personal and geographical names and so on. Furthermore, the corpus will be enriched with contextual information from other relevant data sources using, among other things, Ciprosop, in order to experiment with the... Sorry, my... Yeah, it's not working anymore, but whatever. In order to experiment with a semi-automatic recognition of named entities um, using machine learning models. Last but not least, and let's say this is the icing on the cake, we will experiment with um, training models for the automatic uh, recognition of cuneiform script using artif uh, artificial intelligence in order to design a capture model for the scholarly annotation of cuneiform tablets. As such, we hope to make a first contribution to improving the accessibility of cuneiform tablets, albeit a small group to start with, both to the general public in the case of museum collections by bringing the contents of ta tablets to life as to specialists for study purposes. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katrine. That's it's I mean, we've been working on this project together for the last eight weeks, but you've really brought it to life. So thank you very much for that. There are a lot of questions and comments. So uh, if you scroll up to the top, yeah, yes. um, you could probably see it. So just scrolling down the first one is um i think that was actually from me so question i wonder how many of the one million cuneiform tablets have been digitized i wonder if we know what percentage do you have an idea about that uh digitized as in um available online on the web in photographs or uh digitized as in um available in transcription published um it depends uh, we do have some some um, some projects such as the uh, CDLI, which is the uh, Cuneiform Digital Library um, uh, website, and uh, they are trying. Or Archibap, Archibap is also a, a website trying to um, assemble uh, a part of those. Uh, vast amounts of cuneiform texts, but the problem is that the majority of these texts, uh, these tablets, have not been studied yet. So this means there are somewhere in boxes in museums, um, uh, in, 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 and nobody has ever uh, had the chance to, to, to uh, decipher them or look at them or translate them. So I guess um, in case of digital digitally available, uh, a small part of those 15%. I, I should say maybe a couple of thousands, that's all. Wow, so a lot of work to be done, thank you. The next question is from Will Siever, sorry, I'm not pronouncing this well. How many tablets might still be in private collections unknown to museums or academics? Very good question. Um, well, we can only guess. Uh, especially after uh, what happened the last 10 years in the region. I mean, uh, it started obviously with, with the Americans invading Iraq, the Gulf Wars, and then ISIS, etc. So there has there has been a lot of, of, of looting going on there. And um, there are rumors of, co of, of groups of, of thousands of thousands of tablets, collections uh, looted from sites, mainly in the south um, of, of uh, Iraq. Uh, that have been, yeah, well, they, they just went uh, through the antiques market in Geneva, London, New York, and um, yeah, well, they lost forever, probably, or a great part of them are lost forever. There are some private collectors, a few of them, uh, one, Shoyan, and another uh, who gave his, who wants to be anonymous, gave his collection for study to a university, in this case, Cornell University, um, but we have no clue as to how many uh, of the tablets are lost uh, for us um, forever, probably. Wow, and then Ben mentions that, I think this was actually Ben's question maybe, um, was that those, what about those smaller museums without resources? So he mentions the Peter Scott Gallery on the Lancaster University campus has at least one tablet. Yeah, yeah. well, I guess, most of the museums all over the world, um, they, they have like one tablet. I mean, there is a very small museum here in Antwerp that has three tablets. I mean, and, and God knows how. Well, we actually know we, uh, it's like people have them in private collections. And then when when um, grandfather dies, they, fi they find the tablet and they don't know what to do with it. And they, give, they bring it to the local museum. That's how they end up there, probably. But um, well, yeah, they're in the drawing somewhere. Uh, in a box, in a drawer, in the in the museum, and, and nobody, it's not on, they, they're not even in, in the galleries. Um, the majority of the tablets are somewhere uh, in boxes in, um, uh, yeah. In the cellar, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. I don't know where they keep them, but only a very, very small uh, part, even in the British Museum, a very small part, they have 10, they have hundreds thousands of tablets. And if, if you, you have a look in the galleries, but it's normal, and that's why we want we want to change that. I guess it's normal because you see a tablet, and well, if you if you can't read the the, the cuneiform script, well, it doesn't say much. It's a tablet, okay. And then you have maybe an explanation saying, well, it's a, a field sale uh, from Hammurabi, and um, person X 
sells the field to person Y, and then you say, well, whatever, okay. But the thing is, if you can bring it to life by like uh, saying this is um, this is a person and he was called Ilumushalim and he did that in his life and we know that he had a father and a grandfather and children and they had problems in the family because we have their private letters and they the, his wife was cheating on him and that kind of stuff because we have that kind of information we have that kind of information which really brings it to life and I think that is a new step also for museums to um, for the for, to validate actually their 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 uh, collections for a, a general public, then then it, it, it well, comes to life. It's absolutely, normal. it's normal that I mean you can have a hundred thousand of tablets and yeah you can you can put them in the galleries and everybody will walk. I mean they want to go to the mummies anyway. They go to the mummies of the Egyptian um, galleries. Ah, no, I want to go to the tablets next time. Now, looking down the questions from Patty, in relate another one related to digitization, Catherine. So how many of these images have been digitized as images and how many have have the writing been transformed to text? She says machine readable, I mean. Oh, yeah. OK. And you mean SIPAR or uh, all tablets? Well, I, I will I will answer it for SIPAR, maybe. Um, for SIPAR, um, um, the tablets in the collections, in the American collections, the, the large American collections like Pennsylvania and Yale, uh, they're online. Uh, they're, you can find them in the CDLI. Uh, they have been uh, photographed and put online. I have made a lot of uh, photos in the British Museum, in the Louvre and in Berlin. The problem is that for the British Museum, you can take photos, but you can only use them for private uh, use for, to study them, but you cannot publish them. That's also the reason we have a lot of, of pictures, especially for the seals. We had a project on the seals, on the iconography of seals. And so we have a lot of very uh, uh, high resolution pictures made of, of those seal, uh, partly seal impressions on the tablets from SIPAR. But the problem is we cannot publish it. That's why we make those drawings. We make um, uh, compilation drawings of the very well you you need to, to do something because you always have a partial uh, impression on the tablet but the thing is that a lot of museums like the Louvre like also the British Museum do not allow you to publish the, the pictures you take and that relates very well to Patty's next question in the list um, is the database so I think you mean the possibographical database open to researchers collaborators uh, well in our small group yes uh, we have a small research group here in Ghent so uh, but it's uh, do you mean it's open access for uh, no it's not partly because uh, all the pictures from the British Museum are included and uh, we cannot publish them. So if we would like to, to, to put these, this uh, database on a server in order for, the, the, for everybody to, to be able to use it, which would be great, obviously. First of all, it's, 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 it's a problem of finance. It costs a lot of money uh, on a yearly basis to, put, to, to, to keep it uh, updated. Another problem is uh, the pictures. And the copyrights, so we had to, we have, we will have them to to uh, get all the pictures out. Um, and another big problem is that um, such a database is never complete. You have a lot of information, and then you can you read names and and you in interpret things and translate things, and then through study of particular dossiers you get a new uh, idea of how um, uh, names or uh, phrases can be read, how we have to translate them, how we have to interpret them, and then you go back. So this database, um, it changes like almost every week. Every week we make corrections or like every two weeks there is somebody putting an email, uh, well, we have one mother version, eh? one version in which the changes are made. Uh, then we email, listen, you have to uh, correct that uh, name because it's said to be read otherwise. So mm -hmm. the problem is if you put it online and uh, especially for those, because it would be maybe, well, I understand that it would be great for, for people, especially if you can't read cuneiform uh, tablets, then you have, you have the information in transcription. The thing is, it changes a lot. 
So uh, we the, the the database it's corrected it's complete it's corrected changes every week. So that's another problem. It's it's not it's not a finished um, document. It sounds like a really dynamic living database. That's great. Um, and next question. Of those tablets that you don't have the archaeological context where they came from, how much from the text can you use to possibly work out where they were created? Guessing the database and being able to cross-reference information is helping you with this. Yes. Uh, uh, well, in the, 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 the best thing to do, does again, is the persons uh, attested. So the, the names, the personal names and the persons attested in the text, because once you know that they are um, from a particular uh, city, in this case, one of both Sipars, um, when they appear in other texts and then we don't know exactly where the tablet uh, is from. And, and it's a network of people. We always uh, look at the people attested in the tablets and in connection with the other persons attested in, in the, the same tablet. And if the network is definitely from Sipar, uh, then we know the tablet must be from Sipar. Of, of course, if a temple of Sipar, the Ebabar is mentioned, it must be from Sipar and so on. So we can, the majority of the tablets, uh, I think um, it's, it's possible to, to, to put them either uh, in, in Sipar or Larsa or Nippur, um, that that's that's really well, yeah. The personal names, the geographical names, the institutions, and also, of course, um, the way, for example, in which things um, um, were written. Because in the north, here we are in the north of Babylonia, there the influence of Akkadian, which is a Semitic language, is bigger. Uh, whereas in the south, for example, in Larsa, you will have a bigger influence of Sumerian because it's a, it's a bilingual. Uh, society actually. So in the north it's a little bit like Belgium with Flemish and Walloons. So uh, in the north you will have another uh, uh, much more Akkadian in the texts than in the south. In the south there will be much more Sumerian in the texts. Also the way in which particular legal and economic uh, formulas are, are uh, uh, can be very local. Uh, also the oath. Uh, so that those texts, especially those contracts, there is a witness list and these uh, witnesses, they take an oath. They take an oath by the city god. And we know the various city gods of the various cities. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy, let's say, to link the tablets to the sites. But then again, we don't know where exactly in the city it was found. We don't know in which house, we don't know in which room, in which room, etc. And I think that relates to Ben. I think this is Ben's next question. Does the database contain metadata stating where, how a tablet was obtained? For example, which private collection when the archaeological context has been lost? Um, yes and no. So uh, like uh, our uh, beginning point, actually the basis of everything is the museum number. That's our uh, unique identifier for, for a text is the museum number. And the museum number always uh, starts with, for example, for the British Museum, it starts with BM, British Museum. Uh, for other musea, also they have a particular uh, code. Um, and then, especially for the British Museum, they also have a collection um, number, what we call the batch numbers. And the batch numbers are very interesting because they give us an idea on what day um, they are, uh, they enter the British Museum. It means what day the, 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 the big boxes came from the antiques markets in, in, in Baghdad and entered by ship the British Museum at the end of the 19th century. And by, uh, so those, those collection numbers, those batch numbers, give us an idea on which tablets entered on the same day and so belonged to the same lot, the same box, and in all probability came from the same site. So we, we can obviously link uh, every tablet to the museum collection. Sometimes there are publications of um, private collection, tablets from private collections, the owners of uh, which are anonymous. And then we, um, we identify those tablets simply by their publication. We say, yeah, it's published in that journal or in that volume. Or, uh, so it's not always possible. 
but um, uh, there is one uh, Assyriologist who wrote a very interesting article on the history of the various butch collections in the British Museum. So for the British Museum, we have a very good idea on when exactly those uh, SIPA material, um, those boxes came in, the various years, etc. Wow. Now we're moving back to the digitization side. So Patty asks, are the 2D plus images something like reflectance, reflectance transformation imaging or RTI? I'm afraid I'm not really <laughs> the person to answer that question. Uh, then maybe I can say a little bit yeah. about that. So, um, Patty, um, the Pixel Plus project, so um, that is the viewer that I think um, Catherine showed. Um, apparently, with 2D plus, they had lots of different standards to make 2D plus and they didn't interoperate. Uh, yes, here, this is a Pixel Plus viewer. And as part of the Pixel Plus project, they made the RTI standard, I think, as well, to be able to, so that you could read in different software the different 2D plus images. If I've understood correctly, that's our expert, Hendrik Haumeo. He told us about that a bit once. Does that help, Patty? Yes, yes, that's, that answers the question. Thank you. Brilliant. And now another question from Ben. <laughs> he says, how does cuneiform OCR work? It looks like a nightmare. And then Daniel says it's a nightmare for 17th century prints, let alone 2000 years plus ago. Yes, <laughs> it is an experiment. And um, uh, well, yeah, it is a nightmare. How does it work? Well, the tests we've done so far and that is a screenshot from one of the tests we've done with, with RoboVision, is that we make a compilation photo of a tablet. It means that all the sides, the obverse, the right edge, the left edge, are put in the good order because the, Cunif the, the, the Mesopotamians, they started writing on the obverse, but they didn't end. They wrote further on the right edge, and if then the word was not finished yet, they continued even on the reverse. So they didn't care for layout, let's say. Um, the problem is that all uh, of, the, of the, the lines, they start on the obverse and they continue on the right edge. So we do have a problem there. Huh? You see, that's why we have a compilation. Um, uh, joining all the, the sides of the tablet in one picture. And then there is uh, the, the, the a system of the, the RoboVision system, which allows or allowed me to um, annotate uh, with, with, uh, with a pen or with a mouse of a computer um, the, 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 the signs one by one and identify one sign. Um, and so here you see I did like 20 of the cuneiform signs. And then the idea is to uh, link the, the sign uh, with the Unicode number of the, of the cuneiform sign. And then um, they told me that after, <laughs> if, if you have a, enough material, let's say about 500 um, attestations of the same cuneiform sign, the computer theoretically uh, should be capable of recognizing that uh, particular sign on a tablet never seen before. But we will have to see if that works out or not. But it's it's very, I mean, it's it would be great if it worked out. Cool. Now the next question, I don't know who Parker's three is, so I'm sorry I don't know your name, but you explained a bit more about what you study at the beginning of the presentation. How much do you have to explain, explain to people what you do? Do you feel there's a lack of awareness when it comes to Assyriology? Assyri I can't even say Assyriology. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can only uh, speak for Belgium, uh, Belgium here, but I mean, um, most, most um, first year history students have never heard of Hammurabi. I mean, um, no, there is, there is no... Um, they never learn in high school uh, what Mesopotamia was, um, and it's the thing is, and we are we are a research field that is in between of others. We are not archaeologists. We are not ling uh, we, we do not do uh, linguistic studies. We are not historians, but we do we we use everything. 
we obviously use archaeological um, uh, information and obviously our, our sources are archaeological objects, huh? they, they excavate it, but we, we work with, with languages. Uh, and we study the languages, we study also the, the cuneiform writing systems, etc. And then actually we try to reconstruct the history, but we are not accepted neither by archaeologists, neither by uh, historians, neither by linguists or, or, uh, or, or people working on languages. So we're a little bit at the crossroads of everything and that makes it often difficult. And of course nowadays, uh, with budget cuts, it's it's very hard um, for assyriologists uh, or astrological departments in universities to keep on going because we obviously do not have 200 students. I mean, that's normal. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. But the the, the general public uh, is is absolutely uh, not aware, and and there is. It, it's not that it's that there is no not 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 an interest. I think, but that's again. Well, I think when you can bring those those tablets to life by explaining that, uh, for example, we have we have a nice letter uh, found in the Urutu archive by Urutu's wife, who is actually from Babylon. So she's a little bit of the she's she's a posh girl. She comes from the from the capital, and uh, she married. Okay, he he's a chief dirge singer, but still he's from Sipar, and. Um, she goes uh, back to, to Babylon and, 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 and goes on to Sipar in Babylon, etc. She writes letters when she's in Babylon. And then she writes to her husband and she says, you're a loser. Lapnum ata. So if you want to, if you have losers in your vicinity and you want to say something in Akkadian, you say lapnum ata. You're a loser. So, and we have love problems. Uh, we have, uh, we have such intimate information in these letters, if you can bring that to life uh, by, by uh, explaining basically that in 4,000 years, nothing really changed. I think that would help. That's a wonderful story. And Ben uh, has got an interesting question. Do real tablets ever appear on eBay? I found plenty of cheap fakes and then stunning already links to one on eBay. <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, there are a lot of fakes around because it, yeah, well, uh, but uh, there are, I don't know about eBay, but there are uh, real tablets on auction, Christie's, et, uh, et cetera. Yeah, you can, you can buy them. Wow. And then the next person. I, don't about eBay. <laughs> uh, I even found three or, or uh, three tablets in, in a local antiques shop here in Antwerp. Wow. And then, those were real. Uh, yeah, it happens. You can buy them. Yeah. Excellent. Now, I don't know who the, sorry, I can't read these names. I only get the acronyms. It says the British Museum shares, shares a wide range of 3D scans through Thingiverse and Sketchfab. Um, is there any restrictions on dates or something that limits the sharing from the British Museum? Um, well, no. I, I don't think that if they are um, they are sharing it themselves, then I guess you can use it. The thing is that the the tablets we are studying, uh, they are not available in 3D scans uh, or not even in, in pictures because there is an online catalog on the on the site of the British Museum, and you can um, uh, search for uh, museum numbers, and then then they say, well, it's a cuneiform tablet, and then they say no picture available. Yeah. So and and they well they allow us to come in uh, in the students' room and to to study the tablets and uh, when I started twenty years ago or more you had to make drawings yourself you were not allowed in with a with a camera uh, but well that was too hard so let's say that uh, they changed that policy the last ten years and you can come in with a camera but you have to sign a form that you will use the photos only for personal uh, study use and never publish them. And then there is an additional comment, especially because there are many benefits by using citizen science for the annotation of tablets. And then there is a, a link to an article there. Right, just scrolling down. Please don't buy them. Um, is that everything? Ah, so they've not been digitized. 
So are there any more questions out there that uh, people want to say um, or put into the chat or just speak now before um, we uh, close up for this evening? Any more questions? Well, I think we've gone through a lot of questions there already. So thank you very much, Katrine. That was, I've heard so much about it and it's become even more fascinating now. So thanks very much.